Now, we're finishing off today with um, a gentleman by the name of Mike Frost. Mike Frost lives on the uh, northern beaches of Sydney in Manly. He's uh, been the religious uh, columnist there for quite a number of years. Uh, but that's only a small part of the writing that he's done. He is the author or editor of at least 19 theological books. Um, some of those are, um, are the titles, are, um, The Shaping of Things to Come, Exiles, The Road to Missional, and Surprise the World. Um, if you don't already know, Mike Frost is an internationally recognised Australian missiologist and one of the uh, leading voices of uh, the missional church movement uh, here in Australia, but also uh, across the whole world. And we are privileged today to have the opportunity to um, to listen to him. Uh, he, he can't actually be with us, so he, he offered to pre-record a... Uh, 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 message for us and we've got that we're going to be playing that and it will be available to you uh, following uh, the time that we have today um, but I believe that um, this is going to be quite pivotal to uh, to us uh, and one of the beautiful symmetries that we have here today is that we started off with a powerful image of the table uh, as Tammy kicked us off and, and welcomed us this morning. And uh, today, uh, this afternoon, Mike is going to, to take us out um, and he's going to be talking about the power of the table. So uh, sit back and uh, get a pen and paper or note-taking device of your choice. And um, we're going to listen as uh, Mike Frost shares with us the power of the table. Hi, everyone. My name is Michael Frost, and uh, I want to talk to you about the power of the table when it comes to our understanding of Christian community, family, and indeed our understanding of church. Early in the Christian era, of course, the first few centuries, we often talk about the extraordinary growth of the church, the exponential growth as it spread out right throughout the Roman Empire. And Historians and theologians and church leaders are often trying to uh, figure out what it was that led to this, this incredible growth of the church under you know, really difficult and unlikely circumstances, including persecution and apathy and disinterest and the entrenched pagan kind of worldview of the Roman Empire. And so some say, well, it was because uh, they were much more filled with the Holy Spirit than we are today, or uh, it was actually that, that very persecution that hardened them and, 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 and stiffened their resolve to continue to follow Jesus. Others say they were more bold and less concerned about offending people with their evangelism. I mean, there's all sorts of, uh, uh, of explanations. And I suspect to many regards, all of those are true to some degree. But one of the things that you don't often hear spoken about was the incredible importance of the table to the early church. You see, early churches didn't meet in auditoriums or purpose-built churches like we do. They didn't even sit in rows in the same way that we do, whether in, in, in pews or, or uh, more comfortable seating. Uh, they met around tables, by and large. Um, in fact, it wasn't uncommon in the ancient world for there to be public feasting in your town or your city. Most people saw that happening most nights of the week. Most of those public feasts, and here I'm not talking about a, a dinner party or a gathering in somebody's private space, but a public feast, a big long table or several tables set up in, in market squares or in uh, public courtyards or even in, in laneways or back alleys. Big tables would be set up, food would be laid out on them. People would gather in this very public sense to feast together. But more often than not, those public feasts were actually hosted by what we know today as guilds. Now, a guild was a gathering of like-minded people, usually business people, people who are working in the same industry, uh, the same profession. They would gather together in these collective guilds, which had a kind of a religious dimension to them. It wasn't just a businessman's dinner. There was a real sense in which, say, all the silversmiths in the town or all the stonemasons or, or all the sellers of cloth would gather together, not just to network and do business, but to actually pay homage or to worship the patron god or gods of their particular uh, profession. 
And so, for example, if it was a silversmith guild meeting, they would all meet around this big long table. Offerings would be made, burnt offerings would be presented, certain prayers or chants or recitations uh, would would be done, and there'd be a sense in which they were kind of appeasing or, uh, or, or satisfying their God and anticipating their God's continued uh, benevolence on their work life. And then after that, that sort of religious process, that then it would be like a businessman's dinner. You know, they'd be talking about the price of silver or uh, how hard it is to get purple cloth these days in town. I mean, all the usual networking and kind of business relational stuff would happen after that. So if you were living in an ancient village or, or, or town in the uh, in the Roman Empire and you're walking home along a cobblestone street one evening, you saw a big long table in a, in a courtyard or a square somewhere and uh, and men gathered around it, you wouldn't think twice about it. You would just think it was a, a guild meeting. Uh, you might smell the, the burnt offerings. You might hear the chanting or the hubbub of the of the the, uh, the liturgy that they were engaged in. But you would just keep on walking by because you're not a silversmith or a stonemason or whatever the group might be. It had nothing to do with you. You would just continue on to your home. However, when the Christian movement gets launched, Their meetings, in some respects, look very, very similar. They also often ate at big public feasts. They also dragged tables out into courtyards and public squares and laneways. They also had, as part of their meal, a a ritual, a kind of what looked like a kind of a religious offering of some kind. They they weren't uh, making offerings or burnt offerings or those sorts of things, but it involved bread and wine and certain words were said and certain prayers were presented. However, if you were walking home in your ancient town or village, as I just referred to earlier, and you happened upon a Christian worship gathering, It didn't look anything like any of the guild meetings that you would have perhaps seen on other trips home uh, from work. Yes, there'd be a big long table and yes, it would be in a public setting. Yes, there'd be people all around it. And yes, as I said, there would be prayers and a a kind of a, a ritual of kinds, including bread and wine. But here's the difference. And it was a phenomenal difference. It included women. I mean, if you walked through a public square and you saw a table in which men and women were sitting together, equals, sharing meals with each other, it was staggering. It was breathtaking. It was, it was, it was visually uh, stunning. But if you looked even closer, what you would discover, not just men and women, but you would also discover rich men and poor men, rich women and poor women. You, you'd discover Jews and Gentiles, uh, uh, freed men and slaves. I mean, you would find something so rich and heterogeneous, so unlikely, you'd never see anything before like it, never. You were used to seeing free, wealthy men eating public meals, but this was unlike anything you would have seen before. And here's the interesting thing. If you walk past a guild meeting on the way home, just as I said before, you wouldn't pay it any mind, you'd just keep walking. Well, they wouldn't pay you any mind either. You weren't a silversmith or a, or a merchant, so they wouldn't even look twice at you, you would just walk right past them. But the Christians, when they saw you walking by, they would call to you and they would say, hey, Maximus, you know, have you prepared a meal tonight? Are you, are you hungry? Join us, sit at our table. You don't have to share our belief, just eat our food, eat our meat, drink our wine. And if you join them at that table and you experience that hospitality and you listen to the conversation and you would hear them teaching and encouraging and praying together, and then you would hear them breaking the bread and drinking the wine and describing what their God, Jesus, has done. And then when you would discover they actually believe that their God is not far and away up above this blue dome, a God who we have to appease in some way to hope that he kind of blesses our business this year, you you would discover that they were speaking about their God, Jesus, as though he's here at this table. You know, it was actually said uh, of the early church that they didn't conquer the Roman Empire with swords and with shields. They conquered the Roman Empire with tables. This incredible, radical, unlikely gathering of men and women, slave and free, Jew and Gentile, rich and poor, gathered together around a table with Jesus 
present with them in that place, inviting all comers to join and accept their hospitality. It transformed towns and cities and villages right across the Roman Empire. I can't help but wonder whether we've lost something of that. Definitely in our churches, it seems, where uh, that feast with bread and wine, which we now call in various settings the Mass or the Eucharist or the Lord's Supper or, or Communion, often appears to be kind of quarantined in a section of our gathering, doesn't it? In some traditions, it's a very significant section of the gathering. In others, it sometimes feels like, quick, quick, let's distribute these things or we'll get back to what we really need to do when we gather. But in any case, it doesn't feel like a heterogeneous community slaves and free and rich and poor and men and women and you name it, all gathered around a table, eating, sharing, practicing hospitality, generosity, life, conviviality, freedom, joy, experiencing the very presence of Jesus there in their midst. But by the same token, just as the church in some respects seems to have lost this incredible power of the table, which is meant to be at the very centre of the Christian experience. Remember, Jesus really only told us to do one thing when we gathered, and that was to eat and drink and remember him. Um, not only have we often lost the centrality and the beauty of what that rough wooden hewn table really is meant to be about. But I wonder whether also in this day and age, we've even lost this sense of what a table should be in the life of a family, a community, a neighborhood. Statistic after statistic now tells us that very rarely are families eating together around tables, that the dining room table is kind of often, you know, it's a shelving unit where we just kind of put stuff as we're rushing in and out and back and forth. That People now eat meals often at different times, different members of the family eat meals different times in the evening, that some eat with meals on their laps while they watch TV in the lounge room and some are in their bedroom while they're on their computer eating their meal, that this idea that we we would come together and gather around this table, young and old, mom and dad, kids of different ages, maybe even extended family, grandparents or aunts and uncles and cousins, eating around a table together and experiencing this sense of oneness that the table invites us to experience. That's an increasingly rare thing. The fact of the matter is, folks, that you probably know as well as I do, that when you sit people around a table, there's nothing magical about a table, but watch what happens when you serve food and drink, you eat together, it can't help but elicit a response of conviviality, of conversation, hospitality and the like. A theologian named Letty Russell wrote a book called Church in the Round, where she talked about the need for a church to be three kinds of tables. And I think we can apply this also to our, to our households as well. She said a church should be firstly, well, not in any order, but firstly, she mentioned that the church should be a round table. I'm sure you're familiar with the kind of the business language around having a round table discussion. When you're having a round table meeting, you know that that generally means we're going to sit around a table, but it also means that at that table, we're going to collaborate. We're going to share ideas. We're going to put our contribution to whatever it is that we're working on on the table, and it will be engaged with by others and incorporated or adjusted or edited or changed, and that we make a contribution to other people's uh, ideas as well. The round table idea is that it's a place where collective wisdom is shared, where collaboration happens, where we engage together around a set of ideas that are important to us and that we believe we can incorporate and use collectively in the pursuit of whatever our particular company or business or organisation might be doing. Now, in that respect, the early church was also a place like that. When you gathered together, different people prophesied, different people led, different people made a contribution to the collective worship and learning in the life of the congregation. And families need to do the same thing too, that a table can be a place where as a family gathers, we actually listen to each other. We hear the ideas, the dreams, the hopes, the aspirations, the, the desires that each member has. And that in fact, we contribute to each other's ideas, that, that we, we collaborate as a family around the business of being family. The second table that she mentioned was the kitchen table. Now, here she was probably referring, and Letty Russell was, uh, was 
rather aged when she wrote this. So she was actually imagining a time back in the day where households had a formal dining room, a dining room table, but you also had a kitchen table in the kitchen. The kitchen table was a place where you worked together, not around ideas like the round table, but the kitchen table was where you shelled peas for mum because she was cooking the evening meal, or the kitchen table was where kids often did their homework after school while mum was in the kitchen preparing the evening meal, she was also overseeing the homework. I'm not suggesting families ought to be arranged this way, but we're talking about a, a bygone era, where the kitchen table was where work happened, the work of the meal, homework happened, but it was also a place where hospitality and the work of hospitality happened. She talks about how uh, during the Great Depression, when hobos, as Americans call them, the homeless, uh, would come to people's homes literally begging for whatever food they could possibly find. But hobos didn't come to the front door, which is where invited guests went. They would go around to the back of the house and knock at the kitchen door. And there people would open the door to them and invite them to the kitchen table and feed them whatever meagre rations or, or uh, excess food they may have had. It was at the kitchen table where the kind of work of hospitality and generosity and with the work of family and shelling peas and preparing food and uh, peeling potatoes and the like happened. So what she's saying is the round table is collaboration of ideas and, and dreams and, and work together around who we desire to be the kitchen table is the kind of grunt work of what it means for us to serve each other and indeed others. And then the third table she talks about is that dining room table, the kind of formal dining room table where the invited guests get to eat. The formal dining room is the place where guests, relatives sit and eat and the meal it's sort of a more formal nature than you would get at the kitchen table, which would be very relaxed. But the, the formal meal would be a time where families eat and love and serve and laugh and joke and tell goofy stories and remember kind of crazy stuff that Nana did or retell that funny story about when Dad did blah, blah, blah. It's at the, it's at the dining room table that the business of love and being webbed or knitted together by common stories, by common expressions of affection, conviviality and joy. It's where those things happen. Now, as I said to you before, often those dining room tables are just places where people store stuff or I've even been in some houses where the formal dining room is immaculate. It looks like there should be like a, a velvet rope across the entranceway. I'm like nobody ever seems to go into that place. It does interest me actually that during this time of COVID and lockdowns in in, uh, in many parts of Australia, partly the reason why I'm recording this and not presenting it to you live, is uh, forcing us to use our dining room tables. I bet lots of you have actually turned them into workstations, haven't you, where kids are doing their homeschooling and mum and dad are working from home. I know that's inconvenient and unpleasant and no one wants that to continue, but in a way it's forcing us to rediscover the table. You're working together at that table. Maybe in a way this could be a circuit breaker for us all being in our separate spaces all the time and a recovery, a rediscovery of the central place of what it means for people to sit together, to eat together, to hear each other, to listen to each other, to converse to be bound together by common story, common hopes, and indeed to engage in disagreement and uh, and to share alternate views to the ones that maybe our family is used to us holding. All of these things happen best where there is food, where there's where there's cutlery, where there's crockery, where there's drink, where there's a meal served, an expression of love, and an opportunity for us to talk. You know, in my household growing up, I'm old enough, look at the white beard and the bald head, I'm old enough to have grown up through the days where you did all have to eat at the dining room table every evening. And I don't really remember those meals being particularly chatty or anything. We just kind of ate. Often it was kind of we were keen to kind of eat as quickly as we could and get away from the table. But my mother had a particular ritual that she would perform every night. She would go from the table 
make a pot of tea, bring the pot of tea to the table and put it on the table for it to draw. This was the signal that it was now time for my brother and I to actually open up and talk about something meaningful. I, she would turn the, the, the pot several directions. I can't remember now which way it goes. And then as she would pour out the tea to each of us, it was like, now, how are you really? Now, I seem to recall my father was sort of off into the lounge room at this point. So it, this was not necessarily the whole family gathering. And I'm not wanting to present to you my family as like, you know, perfect, not by any means. But there is something really beautiful about a ritual where a family is it's indicated to them. You're not just refueling at this place. You're coming together and we sense that God is present here. And as a family, there are rituals we perform which invite us to be a round table sharing ideas, a kitchen table working together on common projects, and a dining room table where we laugh and talk and are bound together by common story. It's what the church was meant to be. That's what family is meant to be. The power of the table is a place where genuine conviviality, hospitality, family, community, church can grow and transform the world around it. Well, at least it did thousands of years ago. And one of the most radical things I think we can do is to recover the power and the beauty of the table in this day and age, in our households, and indeed in our churches. Peace to you all, my friends. What a powerful message from Michael Frost to take us out today. Um, you'll see I've posted a question there into the chat um, for you to consider in your groups.